Xavier Salomon is one of the foremost experts on Renaissance paintings. He is currently the deputy director of the Frick and the Peter J. Sharp chief curator there. He received his PhD from the Curto Institute in London and has held important curatorships at the Dulwich Picture Gallery and the Department of European Paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. He's published broadly and curated numerous exhibitions. He's a preeminent uh, expert on Paolo Maranese and also a good friend of the library. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items of business. One, please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Uh, secondly, there will be questions and answers at the end, both for those in the room and those online. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, there will be books available for purchase and signing. So thank you all very much for being here. And thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you for advising. I'm so glad to, it's so, so much fun to be here and continue our conversations about Aranese and Nepal and Boston. And um, I have to thank you too because that catalog over there was something I want to great deal for this book. The catalog for the fantastic Aranese exhibition. So I, I'm very happy that this evening is all about Cynthia's book, but I'm glad that she's also plaque my book. So. <laughs> you're writing a, a book on I can't, I can't ever get enough of it on it, so moving on to the next step, but it's always in my life somehow. Good. It's a piece of my too. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to start off by uh, reading a few paragraphs from the introduction just to set the scene. One of the greatest paintings ever made in the brush. This is the story of Napoleon's theft of Paolo Veronese's wedding feast at Cuba, a vast, sublime canvas that in 1797 the French tore from the wall of the monastery of St. George of Majori in Venice. Veronese began painting the wedding feast at Cuba in June 1562. He was 34 and ambitious. In the 16th century, St. George of Majori was a wealthy and powerful Benedictine abbey and had loomed large in Venetian life. Built of red brick, the monastery stood on the edge of the highland across St. Mark's Basin, the Doge's Palace. Its entrance was set back from the lagoon by a stone cave with wide steps rising from the water to accommodate the long gondolas that on feast days brought the Doge. When two years before, the abbot, Geralmo Sprocchetto, had renovated the monastery's refectory, he had commissioned the architect, Andrea Palladio, to design it. Palladio's refectory was magnificently simple almost austere, a monument to Renaissance confidence, humanism, order, harmony, and restraint. It had become the custom in Northern Italy for monastic orders to decorate their refectories with a large painting of the New Testament feast, placed on the end wall so as to be the focus of the room. The biblical feast that Scrocetto chose for Veronese to paint was the marriage celebration at Cana in Galilee, at which Jesus performs his first miracle by changing water into wine. The contract drawn up for Scrocchetto and Veronese spec specified that the painter, Paolo Cagliaro Verona, will make a painting for us in the new refectory that will be as wide and high as the wall and will cover it completely. Almost from the moment Veronese completed the canvas in 1563, news traveled that he had created an extraordinary work of art, a luminous spectacle staged by a large cast, including musicians. A banquet taking place outdoors on the marble terrace of the 16th century Venice. Dusky reds, blues made of powdered lapis lapis of life-sized figures, 130 of them, standing, sitting, and moving about in a three-dimensional space. Napoleon Bonaparte was a plunderer of art, one of history's most accomplished. He forced his enemies to pay an aesthetic price for defeat by giving up statues and he paraded the spoils and trumpeted his thefts. In a modern and republican twist, he took the heart for the French nation, or for France, or for the world at large. Bonaparte started plundering early in the spring of 1796 when France was at war with the Austrian Empire in Italy, and as commander of the French army in Italy, he led his very first campaign. 
beginning in April, they swept across Piedmont and Lombardy, driving the Austrians east. With a series of rapid-fire victories, he reversed the course of France's war against the Habsburgs and catapulted himself to international fame as a hero of the new French Republic. He was 26. <laughs> Pretty good start for the story. <laughs> so I, I would like to start by asking a question, which I've actually never asked. And I remember when you first called me about working on this book, and I thought, you know, this is such a great subject. And I, of course, knew you and admired you for your previous books, and you wrote about Van Gogh and Dr. Gachet. And then one of the seminal books for anyone who works in museums like the Frick, which is um, called Master's New World, where whenever people ask me, you know, what should I read about all the barons and the arts, that's the first book I always recommend. And so suddenly switching to Napoleon you know, from America to Europe, from you know Frick and Stuart Gardner and Morgan to um, to Napoleon and, and to Veronese, and this beautifully interwoven double story in a way, because yours is the story of the painting, but the story also of what happens under Napoleon. So what, what got you there? Well, um, both those earlier books, Dr. Gachet and Old Masters in the World, were about the collecting of art, the migration of art, and what how that is driven by politics, economics, taste. And uh, while some of my friends accuse me of thinking of plunder as another form of collecting, it isn't, <laughs> I don't. Um, and yet some of the same fascinating issues are involved, including taste, but of course also violence and war. Absolutely. And you know, the, the question of how things get collected and how things, you know, great, even great collections are put together. I mean, we're talking about plunder, but of course, this is a, there's a war plunder that is still in the museum and effectively never returned to where it belongs. So sometimes, you know, plunder becomes part of history and we also sort of forget uh, how crucial it may be in the part of so history of collecting. Yeah, exactly. Because so much, about, only about half of the paintings that were taken from Italy during the Napoleonic Wars were returned. And at the beginning, I think there were plans not even to return those. So, I mean, it was really, I mean, Canova is one of the great heroes of the story who gets a lot of the works of art back to Italy at the time of the Congress of Vienna. But, um, you know, one wonders, you know, if he hadn't been so keen and so effective at that, um, you know, a lot of these things would still be in France. Absolutely. It really was, <coughs> excuse me, um, the Duke of Wellington and the Allies after they defeated Napoleon. I mean, for a they, all descended on Paris, and they didn't immediately decide what to do. And they were very worried, actually, in, in 1814, the first time around. Um, they didn't they didn't make the decision to return everything. They were worried that, and this shows how political these works of art were, that if they had forced them a new bourbon on King, that they put on the throne to give the works of art back that Napoleon had put in the it would undermine his um, authority with the French people. So they debated that for a while. Then they, in 1815, they were so angry at Napoleon. They, you know, they decided that everything had to go back, but not everything did go back, just because of mostly practical matters. And I mean, there we're talking about a you know, massive painting, of course, with the, with the marriage of the Canada. But um, did, I mean, why, why that specific picture and not something else? Because, of course, you know, Napoleon planted so many works of art in, in Italy. And, in general. Why pick, why pick why that? Yeah. Well, um, he, to me, the theft of his painting was emblematic of the whole vast story because he wanted masterpieces. I mean, he, there were a lot of other masterpieces, and he was ruthless in getting them. And the, it also had this wonderful, complicated, and paradoxical aspect to the story because um, even though when the French took it, they did terrible damage to the painting, they didn't terrible damage to the artistic heritage of Venice. And yet, when it came to the Louvre, it was a great inspiration and a model to many of the most important artists of 19th century France. Yeah, so, absolutely. I like that. It was, it's and it's still so central at the Louvre. I mean, you know, it's, it's the painting that's still in the core of the museum. You know, in front of that other famous painting that we all go to see. <laughs> uh, I, I always find it so annoying that you know you walk into a room and everyone's going to one of these and behind you you have this unbelievable thing that you know a lot of people sort of seem to turn around and go oh there's this as well uh, but it's i always joke with the curator 
we're both good friends of the Curator of the Louvre, um, who is in charge of the Venetian pictures, and we always joke with him about it. Um, but he's also, of course, in charge of the Mona Lisa, so it's they're both. It's, it's yeah, I, didn't, I know, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but there, I, we, I was able to get let me in to see it you know, after, after hours, or it would, nobody was there. And he, said, he said, don't you want to look at the Mona Lisa? Like, no. <laughs> There's more figures to look at in the, in the marriage to, 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 to focus on. But I mean, what is, you know, you're saying in the introduction, the poem was 26. I mean, it's really unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, here's this nobody from Corsica who suddenly, you know, through the revolution, through the, the Directoire and a number of sort of, you know, uh, key moments in French history in those years, suddenly finds itself at the head of a fairly small to begin army in northern Italy. And I think one of the, you know, one of the many fascinating things to me about your book is how you explain this sort of almost sort of an avalanche of, of what the French are doing in Italy. How and how it starts with everyone thinking, oh, you know, they're not really going anywhere. And fast forward two years, not even, and the whole of Northern Italy belongs to France and all of these great artworks are sent to Paris. Yeah, the world famous as, yeah. a, as a general. He starts, I mean, it's so fascinating because he um, he starts plundering only a few weeks after he arrives. And he is a very busy man. He has to win the war. As you say, it's not the French army isn't, hasn't been doing well at all. And he writes, I love this, he writes to the uh, French ambassador in Genoa. And he says, send me a list of paintings, sculptures, cabinets, and curiosities. And he names all the states he plans to conquer. And then he... He does it. He goes marches across, conquers the states, and then he has um, all the works of art put into the terms of the treaty. So he's so systematic to make sure that they're not returned. It didn't quite work out that way. But. No, but it's, I, and I think you know the combination of you know you, you talk about Napoleon's poetry at one point as well about how his his um, orders to the army have this sort of poetic quality, and that they really, I mean, sometimes really in this sort of beautiful sort of great glorious language, but then he is so systematic and so cold-hearted about everything and, and the way he manages all of that. And I think through also the network of people, I mean, what another interesting thing about your book is, is the, the spider web of all the agents and the people who are providing the list, they're giving advice, they're taking care of it, are packing the thing, sending it to Paris. I mean, of course, it's not the army itself and it's not Napoleon who just starts creating up pictures, but you know, to move something that flies to Paris plus everything else. I mean, these are the people who bring the Apollo Belvedere to 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 to, uh, to, to Paris and the you know the, the horse of St. Mark's. I mean, it's amazing once you start the lion of St. Mark. I mean, you start looking at the list and, and you think this is incredible. Yeah, and I think it's one of the reasons that they had um, a commission of artists and scientists, most importantly scientists, and they were used because um, I think the French the French understood that they're. Um, the plundering is very controversial, and these scientists were um, have put for France at the forefront of 18th century science, but also because they were very good at packing up the works. They you know, specified the kind of boxes and tried to make sure that they would be safe, even though it's completely high risk. But of course, you know, also our, our approach to plunder today compared to that approach in 18th century. I mean, you know, we live in a very different world. Uh, but, you know, they're thinking back to the emperors, the Roman emperors who, you know, took half of Egypt to Rome and, and would just do that as a matter of fact. It was, you know, no one thought of that as being particularly wrong. And the idea that Napoleon really believes that these works are belong in Paris rather than anywhere else. And he has this sort of uh, idea, which, of course, in more modern times, I think, you know, the only awful echo of that, of course, is Second World War. And the idea that everything belongs in Linz or Berlin or wherever. The Free Road Museum was, was going to be built. Um, and it's really beyond that that the world is looking at these issues in a very different way, I think. And we now discuss you know, where things belong. I mean, it's a hugely complicated discussion, of course. Yeah, well, I think what's so fascinating is really by the end of the 18th century, plunder was no longer the norm. And um, the French Revolution and the Republic, the French Republic revived it with this ideology that France as a republic was the only worthy nation to own these great works. And Napoleon certainly went along with that. And yet already people like Heidenreich wrote, um, he's a German philosopher who wrote um, that 
our plunder is a crime against humanity. And so already people were, and it, it was, the rest of the, Europe did not approve this plunder. But what's so interesting is, um, we talked about that the, the two Frick, the beautiful Veronese allegories at the Frick were also plundered at one point in the 17th century when it was the norm. Yeah, and I think, you know, every museum has plundered works of art at some point, you know, be it under Roman emperors or, you know, later British colonialism and imperialism or, you know, so the two allegories by the Veronese at the Frick were technically plundered in 1648. So they were, they ended up in the collection of the emperor in Prague and in 1648 the Swedes invade Prague and they, they steal everything from the imperial palace and bring it to Stockholm. And there it is. And, you know, and those are also, it's true also of the Veronese at the Met, that was part of the same group of pictures. So 1648, there, there they are, they're war that ends up in, in Stockholm. Um, it's a sort of second plunder as well, which I really love about that story, because what then happens is Queen Christina of Sweden decides to abdicate and moves to Rome and becomes a good Catholic and, and spends the rest of her life there. And it's great PR for the Pope. And, but she, a year before abdicating, she sends all of the royal collection to Rome, which of course technically doesn't belong to her. It belongs to the crown of Sweden, it belongs to her heir. And the poor new king of Sweden suddenly finds himself without a collection because she's taken everything to Rome with her. So that is personal plunder slash collecting, I'm not sure. Uh, but so it's a sort of double plunder in a weird way. And then, and then, of course, you know, the paintings end up in all these great collections, the Orwell collection and the, um, and the Tom Salt collection and, and eventually the Frick. Uh, but it's always worth remembering how these works about travel a lot. I mean, no matter how, you know, I always think of the Frick allegories as being very big, but compared to the, the marriage feats, they're, they're tiny. I mean, that, you know, we're talking about one of the largest paintings produced in early modern, the early modern European world, I think, as far as we know. So yeah, it's still the largest painting in the world. Yeah. And what I love is that the, so the Frick allegories and, um, the wedding feast really sort of came together because of French taste, because the Duke d'Orléans bought the, the Frick allegories, and then his great grandson during the revolution had to sell the whole collection and it went to the English. And I think that um, that was sort of a, that, the background to the French wanting to increase the numbers of old masters that they had lost. They lost something that the Duke d'Orléans collection was supposedly second only to the kings. Some people thought it was greater than the kings. So when it goes to England, it is, the French are very unhappy. And I, I think of that as the background, you know, the way that they, for the plunder, they wanted more works of art. But you sort of see that sort of geographical shift from the 18th into the 19th into the 20th century, where in the 18th century clearly it's all about France and everything is ending up in France for a reason or another, be it <coughs> painting, be it plunder, be it a number of other things. And then by the 19th century, that has clearly shifted to England. And so much, you know, the Orwell collection ending up in England is really the catalyst for the English aristocracy filling their country houses with all the great treasures of you know, Italy, France, Spain, the Netherlands, and so on. Um, and then early 20th century, fast forward to the United States, which of course is the previous book. But um, I always tell people, you know, pretty much everything at the Frick collection comes from an English country house. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where Frick was buying. I mean, you know, he wasn't buying directly from Italy or from France. He was buying mostly, not all these, but mostly from England. So that, again, the fact that our museums in America, I mean, the collection of the Frick was put together in 15 years, effectively. And the amount of works you could buy from English country houses, and that, you know, it's not plunder at that point, it's, it's acquisition. Uh, but it's, you know, but it's fine. It's like, you know, and, and these works are traveling yet again from one continent to another. And I always ask myself, you know, where are they all going to be in a hundred years' time? I mean, where's everything going to end up? Yeah, when people used to ask me sometimes, well, what's American taste? I used to say, American taste is English taste, because yes. everything came yeah. from England. Absolutely. And so Which many of us came yeah. from France before, yeah. And, and French too, it's true. I mean, you know, the combination of French and English taste in, in, in America. I mean, if you think of the great collection, French 18th century is so key to, to all of them. Uh, but then it's with the English, kind of intermediary, let's say, the, the, the country house as the way in between. Um, but it's, you know, the, the circulation of works of art becomes such a fascinating topic in that respect. Yeah, and I love, of course, I love the, thinking about I mean, just the way the 
those American collectors used to art to transform themselves in a way. It's that's a similar theme. And transform yeah. society. I mean, there is always the sense, you know, as hideous as plunder appears to us. I mean, Napoleon is doing it to increase the glory of France, but also for the French public. And he believes that, you know, the Musée Napoleon is going to be this great, you know, he's not getting them to have them in his house and live with them. He's getting them to have them in a museum that's open to the public for everyone to go to. So as you know, problematic as the, the, the way he does that is, there is a background of opening one of the you know, greatest museums in the world. And imagine the Louvre with the Apollo Belvedere and the Laacon and, and all of these works there. I mean, you, you at one point mentioned it, you know, we have to think of it almost like a temporary exhibition because of what happens at the end. But that must have been a pretty amazing exhibition. I mean, going to one place and seeing all these things in one place. Yeah. Um, it's extraordinary. So it really worked. I mean, he, they think they wanted the move to, I say it's his collaborator. Because he wanted the loot, he used was able to use the loot to really legitimize the plunder. Once it was, because it was an institution of the Enlightenment, and a of the democracy, the French Republic, and the French Republic, and yeah, so it, it, he by putting his plundered works in the loot, he could ally them with the with the Enlightenment. Which is the great dilemma I always find as a curator or someone who works in a museum. The dilemma between the museum and the original context. You know, how how to bridge that? I mean, it's great to have museums, it's great to have works about, you know, I work in a museum where not a single work in my museum was made for that museum. So how do you reconcile that and how do you make also your public understand that these are all things that sometimes were made for very specific settings, like in this case, in the, in the Veronese and the Louvre. In other cases, they were made for specific individuals, but all of that is lost by the time the work gets to a museum, which is very different from the way in which artists operate today. You know, every artist now produces a work of art with the idea that that work of art will end up at no matter with me or in a museum. That's your ultimate goal as an artist. There don't need another thought, I want this painting to end up in a museum, let alone, I hope, in France. Um, you know, these were made for very specific settings in, in Venice. Yeah, I never expected it to leave, to move. The painting was never intended to be moved. So. That was one of the reasons that um, I think it's so amazing. Most of the things that they took from Venice were altarpieces that were never intended to be moved. So that's why so many of them damaged. They were painted for specific sites. And even though this is the, the one of the ironies that it, I loved is that it's a canvas, so technically it could be moved. And yet it wasn't supposed to be. Yeah, yeah and it's always, you know, when you, when you think about moving these objects, it's so, you know, scary in one way, dangerous, you have to do it for all the right reasons. Um, you know, when I did my exhibition in London, I, it's the only time I'd say anyone has ever compared me with Napoleon, but it was quite funny. <laughs> uh, I managed to get an altarpiece for the show, which I never ever left the church it was made for, except for when Napoleon brought it to Paris. So I was the second person who got this out of the church, <laughs> albeit for three months rather than several years. But um, it was interesting to, to see the reactions, you know, the, the, the priest and the bishop of Verona, who were in charge of this altarpiece, um, you know, all came to the exhibition with their parishioners and the people from the, from the local community, and it was really, really wonderful. And then I happened to be in Verona when the painting was returned, and they had a whole feast in the church to celebrate the return of the work. And I was the kind of bad person who had, like, taken it away, <laughs> but I was also there to make sure it was back and safe. And, and, and you suddenly realize also the, the significance these works have for very specific audiences. I mean, in that case, it was, you know, all the sort of wonderful people that lived in that parish church. And for them, this was the great work of art. Funnily enough, we substituted the painting with a very high res photo so that you didn't notice it was missing for those three months. And several people in the parish told me that they didn't realize it was gone. <laughs> Which I thought was an interesting reaction to it. Um, but taking these things out of their, their context, and I think maybe we should talk a little bit more about Veronese and the, and the refectory, uh, because it is such an extraordinary place and, and, and this commission is so key for his career. I mean, this is the largest painting he ever paints. Um, yeah, and he, the important, and one of the most important things about the picture is that he, yeah, that he paints it for that refectory, that beautiful Palladi, Palladi's beautiful refectory, which is extremely plain, and he, by putting it, um, 
on the end wall, he makes, he really works with the architecture of the room and makes the room seem to open up. And it seems that the piece is taking place on a terrace just outside. And when they moved it to Paris, it's, you really can't get the full brilliance of the painting or the sense of that illusion. And you know the space is still there. I mean, the refectory still exists in in San Giorgio Maggiore. And it's it's you know the, the, refect, the refectory is designed by Palladio. It's an incredible <laughs> architectural space. And the combination of that space with the painting, you know, the loss is not per se the fact that it's the painting is not in Venice. It's the loss that the painting is not in that site. I think one of the things that I always criticize what happened around the time is that many of the things that were returned to Italy, instead of them being put back in the churches were put in the newly created museums, at Brera, at the Academia in Venice. So you have great altarpieces by Bellini and, and, and Veronese and other artists who had, you know, went back to Italy, but didn't actually go back to where you should see them. They went back to a museum, another museum. So in a way, again, it's a sort of almost form of double plunder in a way. I think the fact that the museum stepped in in the early 19th century and, and took these things over rather than sending them back to the churches. And I wonder, you know, if the marriage had gone back to Venice, it may be the Academia today. It may not be no, like the other, because he took another case, obviously. Well, exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's in the museum. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it doesn't, a painting like this, it's very hard if you're looking at the Louvre, you just walk in and you don't have a degree in art history. You know, I'm not sure you really understand what that painting is about, or that it's even in Venice. I mean, you're in a room with Venetian paintings, except for the Mona Lisa. <laughs> but still, um, and the whole meaning of the painting is about, it's a portrait of Venetian society in addition to being yeah. a biblical feast. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that really struck me about your book is how you weave all of that in. I mean, the power of Venice in the 16th century and how Veronese is reflecting that through this painting, through his works in general. But um, how do you think the painting does that? Well, I think by, I mean, it's a very specific portrait of Venice. I, well, it does, it has the biblical narrative. So you have Jesus at the center, and then you have, um, it's the, they take, he takes the moment when people recognize this miraculous wine. You see the wine steward looking up at a glass of red wine. But then the get, guests, and, the, and then the other religious figures, his mother's on the left, and various apostles. And then, to, but to the right, towards the front, those are figures from the monastery. There are two figures in black, and probably the others, it's debatable, debated, but are other individuals associated with the monastery, maybe the abbot or lay people who supported the monastery. And then all the way over on the other side, the bride and groom, and then behind them, or just near them, the bride is in white brocade, white and blue and gold, groom is in red and blue, and just Back from that, them, or, or this group of people who are dressed in these exotic Middle Eastern costumes, and people assume that these are visitors or people who traded with Venice and moved to Venice, and yet um, and there are a few women who are Venetian, like wearing Venetian costumes, but it shows how cosmopolitan Venice was, in addition to very religious. And I think always the idea of what, what Veronese thinks. I mean, I, I said this in, in my book as well. It's not about how the world is, but how the world in his mind should be. So it's always about kind of, you know, make it all as magnificent and wonderful and sumptuous as you possibly can. So this is, you know, the image of what a really great party should be like in Venice. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's to do. Yeah. It's like, you know, the outfits you want to wear, the guests you want to invite, the sort of, you know, the glass and the music. And gold and music. And, all the things, you know, the dogs, the dogs and cats, which are also very important. Um, and it's it's just such an extraordinary thing. And, you know, when when years later he's asked by the Inquisition why, you know, there's another day that supper he paints and he's called in by the Inquisition. And, and Cynthia talks about that in the book as well. He, you know, he defends it by saying that, you know, artists take liberties and that's why he's doing this. But he is meant to represent a dinner that took place in a, in a wealthy house and that's what he's doing. And in fact, the locations of these dinners, you know, if you read the, the, the Gospels and look at them, they're always meant to be very wealthy dinners. And so, you know, be it the marriage feast or be it the Last Supper, the Last Supper also takes place in the house of a rich man, whatever that means.
So he's really taking that and then projecting the sort of Venetian view of what something like that should look like. And also, I think that but to me, when he has this idealized vision of Venice, it's really celebrates the glory of Venice, but also, I think to him, it's the glory of God. You know, that's not, some people have said that maybe they're, this is a warning of Venice, you're going a little overboard. And because the figure of Christ is so, I, like an icon, it doesn't really fit. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that's, it's what I love about it is that, you know, there's so many interpretations. Yeah. I mean, to me, the biggest lesson with this picture is, you know, having known it, known it for many, many years at the Louvre, um, you know, you see it at the Louvre and it, you know, it's an incredible thing and it's, it's just such a marvelous painting. But then recently there was this project to do a facsimile of it uh, and place it in the refectory at St. Georgia, which, you know, left me a little skeptical to begin with, to be perfectly honest. I thought, you know, what's the need of that? And it's going to look very strange. But the people who did it did an incredible job. And, if you're not trained and you don't know that it is a vaccine that you could mistake it for the real thing. But what really struck me is that once you have this vaccine at the right height and the right place on the right wall with the right light from the windows and all of that, you come up the stairs into this refectory and suddenly the painting makes sense, which it doesn't have the roof because it's lower, you see it sort of, you know, you come in then turn around, you don't have the right distance. And what really struck me is that suddenly the figure of Christ becomes so clear. It jumps out in respect to everything else. So the, the sort of apparent confusion that you even get in a slide like this, in, in real life, was a totally different thing. And of course, this is painted in situ. So we know Veronese worked in the refectory almost as if it was a fresco. He had scaffolding there. He eats with the monks every day. They give them food. And I, I can see him with a portable scaffolding, working the things out, checking it from the main door, making adjustments and making sure it works in that specific location. And that again, you know, apart from the romantic idea of why these things are not in their original location, there is the fact that they're intended to be seen in that location for a reason. And they make sense in that location, again, because of the height, the lighting, the, the way you see it. So it's very low at the Louvre, for example. So you see it in a way you're not meant to see it, you're meant to see it much higher. Yeah, it's supposed to be the level of these high windows. And what you could also, when you stand there, um, in looking at that facsimile, it's, I mean, it's an unbelievable experience because, I mean, the Polanyi had created this ceremonial approach with 12 steps and the ante room with three more steps, get to the door. And once you're inside, um, the, the refectory is a freestanding room with these windows on both sides. And so it really seems, I mean, you realize this is portrait of the city that you are in, you know, it's a portrait of Venice. And, you know, if anyone goes to Venice, I encourage you to go there because it's it's a really incredible experience to see the facsimile that way. And again, you know, the procession going up the stairs, also the door frames the picture. But of course, because of the perspectival thing, all you see is Christ when you walk in, and then it opens up as you walk into the space. So you don't see the entire painting from, from when you first come up, and you see it from below because you're going up the stairs. So it's... It, you know, I realized only then how clever this picture is. I mean, I, I, I should have known it all along, of course, and Veronese is very clever in that way. But every time we remove one of these works from the original context and bring it to a museum, we're losing a huge amount of the meaning of that work. Well, and I say that as a museum person, but um, I think this is a very This is a dramatic example. That's one of the reasons I wrote about it, because I thought, mm -hmm. this is the biggest damage they've done in a way, yeah. you know, in addition to the physical damage. So when you look at the, so these four windows on either side, you look up at the sky, just like the sky that he paints. And he's, that's what's so much fun about there. And he's, you know, the illusion is that he's playing with. He's yeah. someone always <laughs> thinks about, you know, we, we, we talked in the past about how, you know, he's described as a decorative artist in all the sort of pejorative terms of decoration. Today, you know, there's nothing wrong with decoration of being the cop decorative, but um, he really thinks of the whole. So whenever he's frescoing a villa or working in a space, he does think of the relationship between those things. Even in churches, he often designs the frames that go around the altar pieces, and the relationship between the frame and the altar is very important. And, it, and it's something that he thinks about in a very holistic way, let's say. Um, unlike, I think, other artists at that time, I think Titian is less so, um, doesn't think about it quite in so much detail. Um, Tintoretto is sort of overpowering you always with emotions and things, and sort of bombarding you with images, and doesn't quite care about the subtlety of, of the of his face. Um, but there is a reason for that. The whole thing yeah. is, is architecture. Yeah.
painting. Yeah. And everything's so cleverly thought in terms of how you see it, how you experience it as you go through. And the combination of what is real architecture, what is painted architecture, what is real what glowing, landscape. what is real landscape in the window. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, fortunately in that case, the frescoes, you know, <laughs> some of them have been somewhat damaged, but you don't, you know, you don't lose that effect as much as you do with this, where you know, in the museum you really don't understand it. But... No, I don't think it's very lost. Yeah. One of the things I thought was so interesting that you said about Veronese is that um, he's, people say, we well, didn't paint that many portraits, but he did, because he, he didn't paint so many freestanding portraits, but he painted many portraits in these religious scenes. Yeah. They're actually and a part of them, yeah. And this, um, one of the things that's interesting is the question of whether the musicians um, in the front, whether the man in white playing the viola de gamba is a self-portrait of Veronese, mm -hmm. which um, Boschini said in the 17th century, and then he said that Man playing the double bass in red is Titian. Huh. It's a very appealing um, idea, which, uh, and it could be. He looks, yeah. doesn't, there's only one bust of Veronese done posthumously. It doesn't look that much like that, but it doesn't look that different. Yeah. And then the man, um, the wine steward who's lifting a glass of red wine, um, is supposed to be his brother, Benedetto, mm -hmm. who also looks like that. Yeah, they look very similar, the two, it's true. And that figure that in the, the cup area appears in other paintings by Veronese, so it's, I think it's quite likely to be his brother. And if it's not his brother, it's someone clearly that's close to him, like he's portraying a number of times. Uh, there is a saint figure that he does around the same time in the early 1560s, and it's clearly the same man. Um, but, you know, the idea of including your portrait, your self-portrait as an artist, or portraits of other people, in these religious figures, and you know, people keep thinking it's a very sort of blasphemous and strange thing, but it's actually not. I mean, people were doing it the whole time in the Renaissance in Italy, and in Venice especially. I mean, the, the last altarpiece Veronese paints, which is extraordinary, shows a miracle of a saint resurrecting a boy, and the man helping the boy is the parish priest of the church who's holding the boy up over the high altar of his church, and another church, another priest at San, San Gimignano. Uh, the organ shutters of that church have the image of the patron saint of the church with his face on it. So he is identifying as Saint Gimignano, as the saint of the church. And I imagine parish parishioners going to mass, and then you have the real priest on the on the altar with his portrait as a saint above you, and there was also his bust to the side. I mean, it's it's extraordinary, but clearly they did it. So the fact that a lot of the of the monks were in this, and you can see them at the back on the right, there are, there are a number of them. And actually a couple of them are also um, paper portraits that were attached over it later on. So clearly there's a change there, the Renese only had access to these monks later on and sort of added it on. Tintoretto also did it a number of times, this thing of adding the paper and um, faces. But I just imagine the conversations of the monks and the refectory as like, my portrait is there and yours is, and it's like, you know, <laughs> and, and you know, they're all sitting there eating. And, and the fact that you see yourself up there together with Christ and the Virgin and this great miracle, it's pretty extraordinary and, 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 and kind of fun at the same time. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, one of the things I love about um, the painting too is that it all started with this contract. The contract is so interesting and it, and it depended on the sophistication of the habit who insisted that Veronese um, himself paint the picture. Yeah. And also, I mean, all that stuff about having him, giving him food and barrel of wine, barrel of wine I think is really to keep yeah. him on the job. Yeah. So he won't, you know, go off and he's very popular at that time in Japan. And, um, yeah, yeah, and, and he, he insisted on using, um, that Veronese use, use only the finest colors and use Ultramarine. Yeah. An ultramarine was made from powder, powdered lapis, the most expensive blue, more expensive than gold leaf. And he, in other paintings, if he wasn't, that wasn't demanded of him, he would use different, less expensive blues. And um, that's one of the reasons the sky and the other colors are so fantastic now, so bright, so brilliant. And so I think it's, you know, in some ways I thought, and, Verne and um, Venice was one of the only places where it had the biggest market for pigments in Europe. And he took full advantage of it. And in some ways, I think this is the, Venice is the only place that they could have really painted this painting. Absolutely. In terms of materials, for sure. 
Um, but I think the other extraordinary thing is how quickly he paints it. I mean, he does this in a year. And, you know, plus doing that, you know, it's not like he was just working on this. I mean, he's working on a whole number of other commissions. But I think people went to Veronese a lot in Venice because they knew he was very fast. And Veronese is someone, I, I get this idea having worked on, it, on his paintings. I mean, there is no evidence from the time, but he's someone very systematic. He plans everything ahead. And once he gets to the canvas, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he has a technique. He effectively translates fresco technique in oil. So his technique is much faster and, and, and more effective than Titian's or Tintoretto's, who instead of spending a lot of time painting, repainting, changing various layers. You know, he, he has a system where he just lays down the color, he does the highlights, he does the shadow, it's done, finished. And we have a contract for three huge altarpieces he does for a church in Mantova. He does them in three months, a month per altarpiece. And, you know, you look at that today and you think, this is unbelievable. But he clearly, I mean, he must have been a workaholic, I'm sure you had help. I can't believe you painted all this yeah. by himself. I'm sure he was sneaking his assistants in while the the, the prior wasn't looking. Yeah. But um, the, the problem is when you say and those three ceiling paintings from San Sebastiano, you say it took him less than a year, and to restore them recently, it took, took a lot longer. Took double the amount of time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. We always joke that restore it. It takes longer for them to restore it than it took for him to paint. Uh, but it's it's usually because I'm not sure when this was restored. It took them a long time as well. I think it was more oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 Um, and tons of people. Yes, a whole a whole huge group. So I I realize we're you know as much as we would both love to go on talking about all of these issues, I think um, we should probably open it up to questions from the audience. Right? Yeah, I, I, I will say that one of the things that for me that was great is that I realized it when I was thinking of the. I wanted to frame the book using the um, Napoleon's campaign and that fast pace of that campaign. I realized, oh, this should be the fast pace of the book. And Napoleon and Baronese has the same fast pace. It's true. <laughs> they would have gone on, I think, yeah. <laughs> in terms of being systematic and fast. I think they, they, they you know, never thought of that comparison. Yeah. It's a pretty good one. I had to think of how, how exactly big is the painting? 33, um, 33 feet wide and 22 feet high. But as six, you said earlier, 16 ping pong tables. <laughs> That's not to think about. And did it influence Napoleon's idea to have his coronation painted on a vast scale? Good question. Well, it certainly influenced Jacques Louis David, who had a commission to paint it. Yes, because he, he specifically says when he's writing about the coronation, um, when David is, he says that the wedding feast is the largest painting in the Louvre. He says the largest painting in the world, but my painting is larger. And it, it wasn't actually. He <laughs> misstated the measurements of the Berenice, but definitely it had 100 figures in it. The handling of the paint is very loose compared to the way, um, the very gestural look compared to the way it used to paint. So yes, it did. It also I, looks very much like the couture decadence of the Romans. Yeah. Same setting. But you know, people were obsessed with this painting in the in, you know in the nineteenth century and you know all along its time in France. And you know, there are so many copies of it. You know, sketches of some of the figures by Delacroix, by a number of other artists. So clearly, they, they were very, very influenced by it. And, <coughs> sorry, as bad as you know, the plunder is, you know, there's also then the second part, which is you know how it has an effect on culture in that country. And clearly, this was you know a bomb for artists in, in, in Paris at the time. Were really influenced by it. So absolutely, I mean, David and Delacroix, Couture, all these artists are looking. And I mean, and does copies of it. Um, they're all going it's back to it. Cezanne and mm -hmm. the Impressionists. I mean, it's 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 a big thing. Yeah, in, a, in a five-year period in the 1850s, a hundred copies of it were made by artists coming to the Louvre and <coughs> setting up their easel. They have this from the, the Louvre registered right. copies, yeah. And um, and of course Van Gogh, he writes, he writes his brother Theo, and he he explains some of his radical theories in color, and he's describing this picture. Mm -hmm. He thought of himself in the tradition of Delacroix and the Venetians. Um, was it ever, do you think it was ever envisioned that the Louvre might create a space as some other places did because it was so large so that it actually could have this painting be shown in situ 
as similar as they could find here to the San Majority? No, they didn't do that. No, as far as we know. I mean, they put it in one of their big rooms. Um, I mean, the biggest room is possible for that. Because you, you yeah. stress so importantly um, about how, how the, the, the connection of the actual space it was in. So, you know, at some, at some point. And then you talked about, um, you mentioned the where in 100 years where all these pictures going to be, and it's, it's, you know, a fun little travel kind of thing. This isn't going to stop. And um, there was that whole period of time in the 90s when we had this rush of impressions and we were never going to Japan or whatever. But now it seems that the open sesame has really been uh, the Middle East. And you know, when Saudi gets its act together for all the museums, it's still in the to see a real blending program or exodus really in, in, in global terms. Do you agree with that? I, yes, but I'm still curious because you know I remember you know, the whole big discussion about Japan. You know, I grew up in the 1980s and Japan was it. And it was like, you know, we're all gonna speak Japanese, yeah. we're all gonna be in Japan, mm -hmm. all of the collections are gonna be in Japan. But Fast forward 40 years, and that's clearly not the case. Um, it didn't happen. And now the discussions are very much the sort of Arab world, Middle East, and, and China. I mean, I think there's a lot happening with China as well. You know, China has an interest in, in, in European art, but I would still say that primary interest is all Chinese art, frankly. Uh, in the same way that Russia, you know, there's always discussion about Russia, but Russia is the most interested in Russian art. I mean, there are exceptions, but so I think it's hard to predict. Yeah, but it does depend on who it, it depends on money, where, yeah. you know, yeah. where, yeah. where the money goes. Where and I think goes. that's a big question now for the future, I mean, where, you know, where does all of that shift happen? Yeah. It's, it's not going to be sudden, but it's going to be. It already is, I guess. But what, yeah, what will shift over there? I mean, contemporary art? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I would guess you know a lot of contemporary art is, is moving in those directions yes. already. I mean, very much so. Because all these things are in these, all these things are in museums. All the master paintings are in museums. It's, yeah, they're not. There's hardly anything on the market anymore. So, sand dunes. Exactly. <laughs> Question from the live stream. Um, Cynthia, who was the most colorful figure you encountered in your research, other than Bonaparte? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was Clemens von Metternich. Who um, I think Stendhal said he his gaze could fool God himself, yeah. and, and he was the Austrian foreign minister, and he tried to negotiate a peace with Napoleon. He um, had multiple mistresses. He came to Paris, and he and he was the one who organized or really or, you know, organized the marriage of Napoleon to the Austrian princess, because he had or, Austria had fought at war with. France, but then he just basically he realized this was a better way to go, and um, he was very instrumental in the piece. And yeah. um, did they just roll up the painting and put it in a wagon? I mean, how did it get it? <laughs> yes, they did. They did. They pulled it down um, from the wall. They realized that. It was attached to the wall with three rows of nails across the front, attached to crossbars on the stretcher. Each of those rows had 120 holes. So altogether, there were 300 or 120 nails. There were 360 holes caused when they pulled it down. And then they they wrapped it around the cylinder. And this was the biggest painting, so they put that this one first, and then four other masterpieces went on top of it, put it into a crate, um, filled the crate with straw. Nailed it up and put it on the deck of a ship. Sailed it to France. Uh, uh, as a researcher, I'm sure you had a very careful plan about how you were going to go about this and you knew what books you were going to look at. Wikipedia pages. Uh, it's a joke. Um, but, and, but there's always, usually when, you, when people write books and they do big research projects, there's usually some very interesting serendipitous discovery um, and I wonder what role if any serendipity played that you and that's something you didn't know you were going to find out or didn't know you were going to look for that turned out to be crucial or just yes and, yeah. um, well I think you always should go to places you know when I went to Venice of course and I looked at the Venetian State Archives which are fabulous 
and it, it gets to set, like the rest of us, you get a sense of the past. There's a stack of documents of the year that the French, or the month, few months that the French took over, and in that was a list of the paintings um, that the French decided to take. And it wasn't, it's not, it hasn't been that clear how they really made the decision. So it was in the decision I realized was made by Claude Berthelet, the chemist, and they scribbled out this list. It's actually not very neat writing because it's 18th century writing. And they, the way they did it was they were on the ground and they must have used a guidebook, a guidebook written probably by another French scientist, um, an astronomer in Paris who had written a guidebook of Italy. And they started the Doge's palace and just the way we would as tourists today or the way that grand tourists had started and because they want masterpieces so they go to see the most important things and then they um they take a boat across to say st mark's space and to san giorgio Maggiore. so and and then they did it by building by building and so you could see exactly how they went around Venice, and that was very exciting to find and in fact i mean at one point as you say in the book they had all four of the suppers for venice in paris but you know the first one gets there much earlier than napoleon because Louis the 14th also wants one of these suppers to begin with and there are all these discussions with the venetian government and finally for a number of political reasons the venetian government gives him one which is not one of the greatest ones but still and that's still at their side and then napoleon brings two others the one from san sebastiano and the one from santo giovanni paolo which eventually get returned but neither of them goes back to the place they were meant for. So the San Sebastiano one ends up in Brera, in Milan, because also there's this whole weird thing later on where Milan ends up getting a lot of the Venetian pictures. So a lot of Tintoretto's and Veronese and Titians that should be in Venice ended up in Milan. And so they have that supper. And of course, that monastery was then destroyed, so it doesn't exist anymore. It's the architecture faculty now. And the Santi Giovanni e Paolo ended up at the Academia in Venice, where it's still to this day. And that monastery is now the hospital of Venice. So the, the history of these, these buildings, it's also quite interesting. And it's sort of amazing that San Giorgio Maggiore is still pretty intact, actually. It's true. It, yeah, because it was really destroyed. There are terrible pictures, there are unbelievable pictures of it. Um, destroyed first by the French and then by the Austrians who used it as army barracks. Mm. But then it's but also it was, and, yeah. and another thing on this list, I learned, uh, because the, he took the two, the wedding feast of Cana and then the other fabulous feast, um, um, Feast in the House of Levy, but that wasn't a first choice of these French commissioners. They had selected the Tintoretto and um, the restorer who had been working on it, they had seen it in his, his studio. He said, you can't take it, it's much too fragile. And it happened to be that the, the studio was in Santi Giovanni e Paolo, a, a monastery, and they walked around and they saw the son of Veronese, you know, absolutely magnificent better than the Tintoretto, and they said, we'll take this. So that was interesting, and they had him been their first choice. I mean, they're doing this shopping list. I mean, my hidden secret sometimes is like, you know, wouldn't it have been so much fun to just, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that out loud. But it's, it's um, really fun but, to you know, follow them around. Yeah, yeah. They're just going down and say, okay, we'll take this, we'll take that. And I mean, unbelievable. You know? but, yeah. I'm thinking about the reception of this painting and the um, Compagnie de Maggi in the um, Medici Chapel in Florence and the transubstantiation or the uh, imagining yourself in the procession. Was that happening? Was that commonly understood in this painting? I mean, in the 16th century or later in the 18th century when it's in France? When it was painted. When it was painted. It's hard to tell, but I think you know, we don't have any evidence of it, but I think you have to think of this in a functional space, because the refectory is a functional space to all intents and purposes. I mean, the monks are eating there three times a day, and they see this, and they see this miracle happening in front of their eyes, you know, they don't have cinemas, they don't have laptops to watch movies, and, you know, and also they're eating in silence, or people the tables eating, you know. ran down the sides of the refectory, and the cabin table was in the front, so it mirrored the painting, the table of the painting mm -hmm. mirrors them. Mm -hmm. So it's as though they're, and the abbot is exactly below Christ. Mm -hmm. So you have this, you know, very carefully. Um, I was telling Cynthia, I actually had the experience of eating in a monastery of this kind um, for a couple of weeks. I was doing research in a monastery in the middle of nowhere in Italy. 
and it was very funny because I arrived and the prior who was also their archivist, I was looking at the archives in this in this monastery, said to me, you realize you have to follow the rules of, of um, you know, being in the monastery and you cannot get out and you have to be in here for the two weeks you're here as a guest. And I said, yes, absolutely. And then he says, and this is the key to the back door. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I actually ended up staying with them for the full two weeks because there was really nowhere else to go. It was the middle of a forest in the mountains. But um, the... I would eat with them at dawn and at lunch, and, and it became incredibly moving. So the picture I was working on was actually in the refectory and was commissioned in the 17th century by the cardinal I did my PhD on, who insisted to have his portrait in it. And there I was eating under this with these monks wearing the same costume as the monks depicted in the painting, you know, 400 years later. And it was really powerful as, a, as an idea. And you realize how real it becomes. You know, I'm not sure they would identify with so much of it, but it's it's clearly this thing you're looking at every day and meditating over. And they would have read passages from, from the Gospels over lunch or dinner and, and breakfast. So, you know, I'm sure they would have read the passage of the Feast of Cana and would have been looking up at this as you're reading that. So, and the, the memory of the previous monks who commissioned that were portrayed in it, there they are in front of your eyes over and over again. So I think, I think yes, I mean, there is this very powerful way in which the space is used. And that is, again, something that, you know, in a place also like Vila Banca or Mazer, I always wonder, you know, it, it's how you use the building as well. And of course, now we visit it as tourists and it's wonderful and beautiful. But you have to imagine a space with parties, with people living in it, with kids running around and dogs and monkeys and, and people drinking wine. And, you know, that's the sort of way these, these works were intended to be used. Again, Veronese never painted the decoration of Mazet thinking this should be a museum and people should come and buy a ticket and visit it and, and not take photos and, you know. So it's, it's yes, I mean, I think it's a very direct experience. Thank you. Susan, what's the um, architecture in the painting? Is it just completely idealized architecture so it adds another element of the ideal? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Does it correspond in any way to anything? In part it does. I mean, the floor does. Uh, I see the slide is gone. The floor matches the floor of the, of the refectory. But the architecture itself is, I guess, his, his yeah. versions of the San Sovino. Yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you have San Sovino at the time, you have Palladio, you have San Michele. These are all these artists who are. It's a big shift in architecture in Venice where they're trying to move away from the kind of gothic, you know, what we think is ultimately Venetian, the, the beautiful sort of tripartite windows and, and the, arch, the pointy arches. You know, they're moving away from that and the, the Doge Gritti in the 1520s is trying to make Venice into the new Rome. And so they, he introduces classical architecture and what Veronese is doing is very much following in those footsteps. So this is an ideal, you know, there is the plan at one point to demolish the Ducal Palace and rebuild it and have a Palladio building. And Palladio does the designs for the Ducal Palace, which, thank God, never happened. But, um, I mean, it would have been very beautiful in other ways, but it would have been something along those lines. There is also the discussion about how much his brother works with him on the architecture, because there are these early mentions of the brother being particularly interested in architecture and helping Veronese with the architecture. So. And there are some drawings that seem to be by the brother that are mostly about architecture. So it, it's a combination, but I think, yes, I mean, they're ideal, there are no real buildings, but there are some things that are picked up in the real space. So there was a question at the back before, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, congratulations. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the response to the, the theft, as it were. Um, you, you mentioned that there was this kind of Republican idea of sort of a way of rationalizing this to act. Um, I wonder how, if there was pushback to that, like did anybody outside of France say, was there how, were there howls of hypocrisy? Or was this seen as sort of part of the classic enlightenment pattern of you, know, you go from a republic to a democracy and then to anarchy and then tyranny? Was this sort of seen as, you know, a symptom of <laughs> France's decline? And that, that? No, I think they, it was, people were conflicted. I mean, they, there was a lot of, criticism um, from the British, from the Germans. And yet when they set, saw the museum, when they came, they were just very confused and dazzled at the same time as they were horrified. Um, because it was a victory monument and at the same time it, they, the French had cat cataloged all these works and put them in a systematic way. So they were really, in front of them was the history of art. And that was 
something in the, in the grand gallery, there were 900 paintings and people couldn't help but be overwhelmed. And also this is still a world that doesn't have the National Gallery in London, doesn't have the Prado, doesn't have any of those museums. So the Musée Napoleon becomes a real model yeah. for everyone. Yeah. And those, a lot of those museums are then created subsequently, partly to do with the royal collections of whichever country, partly not. I mean, the National Gallery is a case in point in London where it's not the royal collection. So the royal collection still exists to this day as a separate thing. They create a, a museum <coughs> for the public in the 19th century. So, and, and the models are clearly the, the model. Of yeah, because country. the model of, you know, a museum in Germany or a museum in London, um, it's not the, their own national, it's not English art exclusively or German art, it's masterpieces of all of Europe. So the model is so very, very powerful. Exactly, yeah. it's a very powerful model. I mean, the question is, who works belong to and, and, and where do you display them? And, you know, the royal collections are a very different way of doing that. Museums, public museums have shifted a lot, obviously, from Napoleonic times to today. But that principle really sees the light at that moment. I mean, the Vatican, for example, was always open to the public, but it's very clearly the papal royal collection, let's say it's their private collection, which people can go and see, which was true of many royal collections, but it's not meant to the idea of, of being a museum for the public. And it only again becomes one, one of those museums later in the 19th century. And um, I mean, Napoleon really succeeded in, in moving the art capital of Europe from Rome to Paris. And then when I think it's so, you know, when, when Van Gogh was, an ambitious artist in the Netherlands. He really, in order to, all ambitious artists really had to get their training in Paris. In the, an earlier century before, early in the 18th century, they would have had to go to Rome. You mentioned that uh, Napoleon tried to justify or legitimize uh, the plunder of some of these artworks by uh, including in the treaties of the countries or regions that he conquered uh, some specification of the artworks. Was that the case with respect to this? And, and was that always the case? Or were there some where he just helped himself to uh, what he could? Oh, and conversely, was there any uh, treaty at the end of the Napoleonic Wars where uh, the countries specified the return of, of artworks? That's, so that's one of the the legal issues are very interesting. He, 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 in Italy, he's almost always specified the number in the, with the wedding gift of Cana, 20 paintings. Um, and this was number six. <laughs> and, um, and yet when then he, when he went to later, when he's the French emperor and he go, he's wandering in Germany and Austria, he doesn't bother with these treaties anymore. He, he just, and, um, it's interesting, and by that time, the, the museum people in the collections are very aware that he's coming and know what's going to happen, and they move a lot of the works of art out, out of the capitals. But that wasn't the case in Italy. And then later, um, there wasn't the works of art were not put into the treaty in 1815. It was just after this treaty was signed, the Duke of Wellington and the Allies just decided they have to return everything, and they had their armies there. And they went to the Louvre and they got the works of art that they could. So it wasn't, and then with, with um, the wedding feast of Cana, um, it, Austria was in charge of Venice. And it was up to the Austrians to get this painting back. And the head of the Louvre, Yvonne Denon, said, it's, if you try to move it, um, it will be damaged or maybe destroyed. And that memo was sent to the Austrian emperor happened to be leaving Paris that day, and he made the decision the French could keep it. And so the Austria signed, yes, you can keep this painting. So legally, that seems pretty, um, and the ethical issue that it should have gone back is a different. Mm -hmm. interesting. But also other things, you know, things were also sent to provincial museums in France, <laughs> and those didn't really return. So, which is partly why Bordeaux and Caen and Rouen have great things from Italy which ended up there with Napoleon and, and never came back because when Canova went to ask for the things, he focused on what was in Paris. Um, and that has an echo, for example, in more modern times with Russia. So a lot of things from Central Europe and Eastern Germany that through the First and Second World War 
ended up in Russia. Everything that was in Moscow and Petersburg, a lot of it was returned to Dresden, to Warsaw, to those places. But a lot of things have gone to provincial museums in Russia, and people are still finding things in provincial museums in Russia that no one knows are there. And so there's still things that are that are missing. So that is part of it as well. And and as you know, good the intention may be behind one of these treatises in terms of returning things. Often there are a lot of things that fall through the net of what does go back. And that's clearly yeah. the, same, the case with it. All these provincial museums, yeah. they couldn't be bothered to go and get them. Yeah. So, I think, and one of them was Versailles. It's a fabulous, very amazing yeah. ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Versailles. Now it's in the same room with the Lady Fisicana. Yeah. And, and those are two, I mean, there are two ceilings from the Ducal yeah. Palace in Venice by Veronese, which ended up with Napoleon to, to Paris. And they, they're still in Paris. And they have copies in the Ducal Palace in Venice. <laughs> so. That's wonderful. So I think we might move towards wrapping up. I'm going to toss in one more question um, from the live stream, if that's good. Um, obviously, this is a huge topic, but uh, if you want to say a few words, what are your personal feelings or opinions about when stolen items should be returned to the countries or cultures where they came from? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great last question. That's a great last question. I mean, it's, how do you start? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a hugely complicated issue. And In principle, yes, yeah. things should go back, but do we, you know, should Rome return all the obelisks to Egypt? I mean, do you go as far as that? Where, where do you stop? Should and, Frank return its paintings to yeah, Prague? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and even not, I mean, not, you know, before Prague, the Veronese were in Venice, and we don't know where. So, so you know, how how do you do that? I think there are certain cases where the legislation is, is very clear today, and rightly so, about you know property that was you know, stolen or taken out illegally. I mean, we've lived through a hundred years of incredible changes in the world and, and incredibly traumatic events for second and first world wars. Um, and I think you know things relating to that are one thing. Things relating to colonialism in a number of other ways uh, are important in a, in, a, in another uh, way. The, I always sort of sit a little bit in between on these things. And I think there is the question of the original context and there is the question of, you know, who do these objects belong to? I think ultimately great works of art belong to the human, to humankind in general. They don't belong to a specific city or specific street or specific institution. Um, that's my sort of idealistic way of looking at it. And you have to think that for whatever it's taken with violence to another country, there is then a cultural impact that those objects have on those countries. The impact of the Elgin marbles in the English Anglo Saxon world, it cannot be estimated. I mean, it's an incredible cultural um, influence. How the Elgin marbles were taken out of, 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 of Greece and why, I mean, that's a hugely complicated thing, which I'm sure we can all go on discussing for a very long time. You know, if you return those things to Greece, where are they going? Are they putting them back up in the Parthenon? No. So they're not going back to the original context, they're going to another museum. It's not the British Museum, oh, it's the British Museum. It's the same thing as well, you know, if you're putting it back in the refectory, great, but if you're putting it in a museum in Italy, you know, what's the point? Recently, I, I was very critical that the um, uh, Earl of Warburn, um, uh, sorry, uh, Duke of Bedford at, at Warburn Abbey, um, sold the Canova Three Graces, which England saved for the country and was bought by the BNA and the National Gallery of Scotland. Now, that was taken out of a little temple at Warburn Abbey that was designed in part by Canova to show the sculpture in the best possible way. By the time the paint that the sculpture is in a museum, you've removed it from that. And frankly, if it is in the UK or if it is in America, if it's in Australia, it makes very little difference. You, you've destroyed that vision that Canova had. So I think it becomes, you know, it's a hugely complicated issue. And I think we all have to go on thinking about it, especially in the museum world and, and being very open-minded about ways in which we can collaborate with other people through loans, through a number of partnerships, uh, but it's, you know, I, I really do, would not like to be in a world where all Italian artists in Italy and all Chinese artists in China and all American artists in America. I mean, that becomes a very reductive way to look at it. If there is a, a history of violence and, and, and war and loot and, 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 and stealing, then it's a very different story. And I think we, we have to be very cautious about that. But it's complicated. It's not that clear cut. And the Nazi um, art looting was you know, connected to the extermination project, it's all those things should go back. There's yeah, no question. Absolutely. And much, much bigger than Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Yeah, a whole other story. Very different. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.